Yes, I'm beginning to read on page 747 in your pew Bible. Page 747, and it is chapter 59, uh, starting halfway through verse 15. The Lord looked and was displeased that there was no justice. He saw that there was no one. He was appalled that there was no one to intervene. So his own arm achieved salvation for him and his own righteousness sustained him. He put on righteousness as his breastplate and the helmet of salvation on his head. He put the garments of vengeance and wrapped himself in zeal as in a cloak. According to what they have done, so will he repay wrath to his enemies and retribution to his foes. He will repay the islands their due. From the west people will fear the name of the Lord, and from the rising of the sun they will revere his glory. He will come like a pent-up flood that the breath of the Lord drives along. The Redeemer will come to Zion, to those in Jacob who repent of their sins, declares the Lord. And then turning over to page 751, chapter 63, beginning at the first verse. Who is this coming from Edom, from Bosra, with his garments stained crimson? Who is this robed in splendor, striding forward in the greatness of his strength? It is I proclaiming victory, mighty to save. Why are your garments red like those of one treading the winepress? I have trodden the winepress alone, from the nations no one was with me. I trampled them in my anger and trod them down in my wrath. Their blood spattered my garments and I stained all my clothing. It was for me the day of vengeance. The year for me to redeem has come. I looked, but there was no one to help. I was appalled that no one gave support. So my own arm achieved salvation for me and my own wrath sustained me. I trampled the nations in my anger. In my wrath, I made them drunk and poured their blood on the ground. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Thank you, Sylvia. Do keep that passage open in the Bible, or if you've closed it, it's uh, on page 747 onwards, 747. So do, do have that open. It's uh, helpful for us to, to see that together. And let's pray. Our gracious Father, we thank you for your word, and we pray that you would teach us from your word this morning. Give us eyes to see, minds to understand, and hearts to respond to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. As a student at Sheffield University, I spend a great deal of my time hiking and climbing in the Peak District. There it is. And uh, especially on what is known as Kinder Scout. That's that... Uh, uh, that flat kind of uh, mountain surface uh, on uh, the uh, slide there. Uh, Kinder Scout is beautiful but unforgiving as a landscape, and it is covered in peat bogs. Some of those peat bogs are relatively dry, others are very wet indeed. 
And on one occasion, I was walking across Kinder Scout, and I found myself up to my calves, sort of about here, in peat bog. Very wet peat bog, as it clamped on the sides of my legs. So I began to try to get myself out. But in lifting one foot out, I pushed the other foot further in. Uh, so I thought, well, that's okay. I'll, I'll just kind of reverse it. And so I tried to push the other one out, and in so doing, pushed this one further in. And after a few attempts at that, I was up to my knees in peat bog. I could not get myself out. It was impossible. And that is exactly the problem that's faced by God's people here in Isaiah. They weren't stuck in a peat bog, unable to get out, but they were stuck in their own sin with no way out. And that's what we saw last week, if you were here last week when we looked at Isaiah 58. You remember in Isaiah 58, the people were fasting, but as they fasted, they argued and quarreled and fought. And the people kept the Sabbath, but they did so as they pleased. They just could not get it right. They were disobedient to God and couldn't get it right. And the first half of chapter 59, which we didn't read this morning, unpacks that problem a little bit more. Do you see there in verse 2 of uh, chapter 59, your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. And now, as we move to the second part of chapter 59, and it's parallel in chapter 63, as uh, Sylvia read for us, we discover the depth of the problem faced by God's people here in Isaiah. Here, the Lord God looked at his people, the nation that was meant to be a witness to God's goodness and God's purposes in the world, and he saw exactly the opposite. He saw a people where there was no justice there in verse 15. A people opposing the very purposes of God in creation. A people who had destroyed their own witness to God's goodness in the world. And that is a very serious business. But it's worse. Rather like me and the peat bog, they could not rescue themselves. Do you see that there? If you look down in verse 16, God is appalled. God is amazed that there is no one to intervene. Uh, and if you turn over just uh, a couple of pages to uh, chapter 63, there in verse 5 of chapter 63, I looked, but there was no one to help. I was appalled that no one gave support. And that is the fundamental problem of the human heart. We are distant from God, and we cannot rescue ourselves. We, do, we all do things that oppose God's gracious purposes in us, and we cannot stop ourselves doing that. I recently came across a, a little book written by Catherine Parr, who was the sixth wife, and you may well think the most fortunate wife, of, uh, of Henry VIII. It's a book called The Lamentation of a Sinner. There it is. And you may be familiar with it if you've read C.J. Sansom's Shardlake novels. In it, Catherine Parr, who is the Queen of England, writes this. She says, If I should hope by mine own strength and power to come out of this maze of iniquity and wickedness wherein I have walked so long, I should be deceived. For I am so ignorant, blind, weak, and feeble that I cannot bring myself out of this entangled and wayward maze. But the more I seek means and ways to wind myself out, the more I am wrapped and tangled therein, so I perceive my striving therein to be hindrance, my travel to be labor spent in going back. Isn't that our experience as well? 
And in that sense, Israel here in Isaiah is no different from the rest of the human race, from me, and dare I say, from you. We have a major problem, and none of us are able to solve it. Because like being trapped in the peat bog, the problem itself prevents us from getting out. So what is the solution? Well, let's go back to the peat bog. Uh, I could not get myself out. The more I tried, the deeper I sank into the peat. I guess my presence here witnesses to the fact that I had some very good friends who were hiking with me, and I simply stopped struggling, put my arms up, and they pulled me out. Those are not my feet, by the way. But they pulled me out of the peat. So look at Isaiah 59 and 63 again. Do you see what happens? It is God alone who acts to destroy evil and in doing so rescues his people. Chapter 59, Isaiah describes what God does there in verse 16. His own arm achieved salvation for him and his own righteousness sustained him. Or chapter 63, verse 1, God himself speaks, It is I proclaiming victory, mighty to save. Verse 3, I have trodden the winepress alone. From the nations no one was with me. Verse 5, I looked, but there was no one to help. I was appalled that no one gave support. So my own arm achieved salvation for me. And my own wrath sustained me. And the hostile powers that we see here in, uh, in Isaiah are now not the surrounding nations around Israel, but are rather representative of evil and sin in the world and in our own lives. And so God's victory here represents the total destruction of everything that opposes God's purposes for his creation. Just look at the powerful picture of absolute destruction that, uh, uh, that Sylvia read to us from chapter 63. Do you remember in cha chapter 63, if you want to turn to it and just uh, let's have it in front of you, the watchman is on the wall and he sees somebody at a distance. Someone who appears to be in crimson robes. And he says, who is this robed in splendor, striding forward in the greatness of his strength? And the answer comes, it is I, proclaiming victory, mighty to save. But as the figure gets closer, the watchman sees that his robes are actually splattered with blood. And he says, I have trodden the winepress alone. From the nations, no one was with me. I trampled them in my anger and trod them down in my wrath. Their blood spat spattered my garments and I stained all my clothing. I have to say that our contemporary sensibilities may bolt at that kind of description that we see here of the mighty victor in Isaiah 63. But, it, but would it do so if, for example, we were four-year-old Arlette hiding with her mother in the cellar of their cafe near Pegasus Bridge in Normandy on D-Day 1944? when blood-covered allied soldiers brought them their freedom. Because that's the picture here in Isaiah 63. And just look down at Isaiah 63, verse 4. It was for me the day of vengeance, the year for me to redeem had come. When God acts in vengeance, it's not selfish vindictiveness. It's pure and right judgment by the creator of the universe. Do you see how redemption, salvation, can only be achieved 
by the total destruction of everything that opposes God. So that, that short period of vengeance, represented here by the day of vengeance, ushers in eternal redemption, represented here by the year has come. And God does here what we could never do. This is for God's people, for Jacob. And it is received by repentance. You see there, going back to chapter 59, verse 20, the Redeemer will come to Zion to those in Jacob, that's Israel, who repent of their sins, declares the Lord. And the order of events is important. God destroys sin and evil and then comes to his people so that now they can repent and receive forgiveness and know him. Listen to uh, Queen Catherine Parr again. I remember this is the Queen of England who is uh, writing this. It is the hand of the Lord that can and will bring me out of this endless maze of death. For without I be preve prevented by the grace of the Lord, I cannot ask forgiveness, nor be repentant or sorry for them. If you're confused by the word prevented, it is, of course, pre, in, in the Latin pre, before, uh, vent, in the Latin to go. So unless God goes before me, unless God goes before me, without God going before me, the grace of God going before me, ahead of me, I cannot ask forgiveness. So unless God's grace comes first, we are trapped and we can't even ask for forgiveness. Just as in the peat bog, I was trapped and couldn't even begin to get out. And that's why it has to be God's solution to our problem. And he redeems us because he loves us so much. But what are the glorious consequences of this for us? These passages are so rich, it's impossible to do justice to them in just a short time together. But this, is, this forgiveness is available to us, to those who are not Jacob, those who are living so far from the time of Isaiah, this forgiveness is still for us. Look carefully at verse 21 in chapter 59. Just, uh, verse 21. You may want to turn to it or look at it on the screen. As for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit who is on you will not depart from you, and my words that I have put in your mouth will always be on your lips, on the lips of your children and on the lips of their descendants from this time on and forever, says the Lord. Now, you see it begins there, this is my covenant with them. That's the plural. Uh, Who is he referring to? Well, he's referring to the people in the previous verse, in verse 20. Those in Jacob who repent of their sins. As for me, this is my covenant with them. But now look, as he goes on, my spirit who is on you is in the singular. Every time that you is mentioned here, it's in the singular. So it refers to one person. The first bit referred to the whole of the people of, uh, of God, but now it refers to one person. The one person in whom God has placed his spirit and to whom God has given his word. But that one person will have descendants who will forever have God's spirit and his word dwelling in them. Who is this person? It's the same person that we were pointed to in chapters 49, 50, 52, and 53, if you remember to back last summer. It's the person who is the suffering servant. It is Jesus himself. Because we cannot save ourselves we need Jesus 
to achieve our forgiveness for us. It is because we trust in Jesus, because we are in Christ, in relationship with him, and as such are his spiritual children, his spiritual descendants in that sense, we too receive his spirit and his word to dwell in us. And so we can be what God's people were always meant to be, witnesses to his glory. But here is the most important consequence of God's solution. As those who are in Christ, not only does God forgive the guilt of our sin, but he also destroys the power of sin in our lives. We're no longer trapped by the things that we do wrong but are free to live lives that glorify God and so witness to the world what God purposes in our lives. Just listen to the Apostle Paul writing to the Romans. There in Romans 6. Thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey him from your heart. Sorry, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. Just a couple of weeks ago, we remembered the 80th anniversary of D-Day. And just as D-Day marked a decisive blow, there were still plenty of minor battle skirmishes that still had to take place before final victory. And so in the same way, there continues a battle within us between our natural inclination to sin, to rebel against God, and the power of God's Spirit enabling us to live for Him. Sin and evil have been destroyed on the cross. And those in Christ are free to live for God so that the world can see God's purposes in action. And these passages challenge us, these passages here in Isaiah challenge us to live by God's Spirit and God's Word in us because the Spirit and Word enable us to resist sin and live for Him in His strength. Which means that this week I can live a life that glorifies God. And this week you can live a life that glorifies God. In fact, as uh, John T. so helpfully reminded us earlier on, the armor that God puts on for this decisive battle in, uh, in chapter 59, when he puts on righteousness as his breastplate and the helmet of salvation on his head, is the very armor that is now available to us, according to the Apostle Paul, so that we can stand firm. God gives us his armor, as it were. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist and with the breastplate of righteousness in place. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. So he gives us the very tools, his Spirit, in his salvation, in his word, to enable us to live out a life that glorifies him. But of course, there will be a day when the victory that is described here in these verses is complete. That last great battle when sin and evil, which have already been defeated, is finally banished completely from the new creation when from west, the West people will fear the name of the Lord, from the rising of the sun they will revere his glory. As chapter 59 verse 19 tells us. And as those who repent, enabled by God himself and rescued by the sovereign Lord, we are to live lives now that show the world God's amazing grace 
than looking forward to that wonderful day when the victory will be seen by everyone. The Scottish preacher, Robert Murray McShay, summed it up in the words of a hymn that he wrote. You may know the hymn, you may not, but here are just some of the words from his hymn. When this passing world is done, when has sunk yon glaring sun, when we stand with Christ on high looking o'er life's history, then, Lord, shall I fully know, not till then, how much I owe. When I stand before the throne dressed in beauty not my own, when I see thee as thou art, love thee with unsinning heart, then, Lord, shall I fully know, not till then, how much I owe. Chosen not for good in me, wakened up from wrath to flee, hidden in the Saviour's side, by the Spirit sanctified. Teach me, Lord, on earth to show by my love how much I Our gracious Lord, we praise you and thank you for that mighty victory that was achieved against sin and evil on the cross through the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you that as we come to him in repentance and trust, you equip us to live lives that give glory to you. Help us to live that out this week. In Jesus' name, amen.